The ancient and unique city of Chester is located in the northwest of England, close to the border with North Wales. The Romans recognised the strategic importance of this site. Built on Old Red Sandstone and flanked on the west and south by the River Dee, Chester became a vital port and trading centre for the northwest. Chester has witnessed bloody battles, sieges, riots, fires and numerous outbreaks of the plague. Ghosts are said to lurk within the historic and modern buildings of this walled city. From royal ghosts to haunted hospitals. From Civil War soldiers to apparitions caught on camera. Here are just some of the many ghost stories from the beautiful city of Chester. The River Dee is one of the principal reasons the Romans built a fortress in Chester. Its wide estuary and strong tide meant large ships could be brought right into the harbour and could discharge their cargoes immediately alongside the city walls. Until the early 14th century, Chester's ancient walls and towers adequately defended the port. But as the Dee estuary silted up, it was deemed necessary to extend the defences further into the river to protect from pirates and other raiders advancing up the Dee. The decision was made to build a new tower to improve the view over the port area, and in 1322, Edward II paid stonemason John de Helpston £100 to build a fortified tower, originally known as the New Tower, and later the Water Tower. At 75 feet high, and with its 12 feet thick walls complete with arrow slits, this formidable fortress was ideal to monitor shipping, ensure customs were paid, and soldiers were recruited to keep watch at all times. The ghostly apparition of a young soldier from many centuries ago has been seen on numerous occasions, in and around the water tower. He is believed to have been on duty in the tower, but overcome by hours of boredom, he decided to become absent without leave, and feeling amorous, paid a visit to his girlfriend. When it was discovered that this wayward sentinel had abandoned his post, the ultimate punishment was given. The young man was taken to the banks of the river, chained to the stone walls, and met his death when the advancing tide consumed him. The ghost of the neglectful soldier is said to return to the tower, where he pays the price for his lustful actions over duty. Nearby, in the water tower gardens and buried under the beautifully landscaped grounds, is a plague pit. Chester experienced a number of terrible outbreaks of the bubonic plague, and this pit is said to contain the corpses of roughly 2,000 victims of this tragic disease. Another ghost story is connected to the Phoenix Tower, otherwise known as the King Charles's Tower, located at the northeast corner of the city walls. The tower is probably 13th century in origin, but underwent alterations and rebuilding over several centuries. Built of red sandstone with a grey slate roof, this tower is a grade one listed building. Above the doorway to the lower chamber, the carved phoenix dated 1613 is the emblem of the city guild of painters, glaziers, embroiderers and stationers who occupied the tower as a meeting place. Chester was a royalist stronghold during the English Civil War and held out steadfastly for King Charles I against Cromwell's forces. But during the 16-month siege of Chester, things were not going well for the king. 
In an effort to boost morale for the struggling citizens of Chester, Charles I visited the city in 1645. It is possible Charles I found the tower's height useful when surveying the area to the east and southeast of the city. Rumours circulated that a crucial battle was imminent and that the parliamentarians were likely to clash with the royalist troops close to the city of Chester. The inevitable battle did indeed occur at the Battle of Roughton Moor, just a few miles from the centre of Chester. Some say Charles remained in the safety of the tower alongside his captain whilst his troops fought and risked their lives so bravely. But it is widely believed that he moved to a greater vantage point at the top of the cathedral tower, where he saw injured royalists return to the city. Whilst he was there, either a roundhead sniper or a royalist gone rogue took careful aim at the king, fired, narrowly missed the royal head, but killed the captain instead, who fell from the cathedral tower. The apparition of the captain in full military uniform has been seen pacing in the grounds of the cathedral, his face pale with shame, anguish and frustration. The Battle of Roughton Moor was a significant defeat for the Royalists, with over 600 casualties and 900 taken as prisoner. Inevitably, Chester fell to the Parliamentarians. The apparition of the King is occasionally seen in the Phoenix Tower and on the nearby sections of the walls that run to the East Gate. In addition, the noise of drums, artillery, muskets, the smell of gunpowder and the cries of injured and desperate men permeate this area on the anniversary of the battle. Today, the banks of the River Dee are enjoyed by tourists and residents who flock to the area known as the Groves, the Riverside Promenade, with its Edwardian bandstand, pleasure boats, summer concerts and vibrant art scene. But behind the Grove's lively exterior is a dark past and several ghosts. This would have been the route of the cart that transported the condemned prisoners of the Northgate Jail to the site of their public execution at Gallows Hill in Borton. The most famous ghost at the Groves is said to be John Clare, a condemned prisoner from 1801 who found himself on the cart with two other unfortunate men making their way to Gallows Hill. John Clare, in April 1801, had been found guilty of breaking into the house of Sir R.S. Cotton and stealing food. He was sentenced to be executed and on Saturday the 9th of May, huge crowds of spectators had gathered to watch the condemned men make their final journey. As the cart made its way along the river, the prisoners were pelted with rotten eggs and food, and Claire decided to do something drastic. John Clare leapt off the cart and descended into the River Dee, where he attempted to swim. Due to the weight of his leg irons, he began to fatigue, and he drowned in front of the crowd. What happened next changed the history of Chester forever. The hangman waded into the river, retrieved Clare's lifeless body, and still took it to the gallows, where he was hanged in front of the shocked crowd. The hangman was paid for each hanging, not for each dead body, and he wanted to ensure full payment. Due to this incident, the crowd's support for public executions changed and John Clare became the last public execution in Chester's history. Executions continued in the jail and at Chester Castle, but not in public view. The ghost of John Clare is said to wander the banks of the River Dee, looking distraught, sometimes shouting, other times muttering, possibly protesting his innocence.
the ghostly figure of a woman dressed in black, including a black veil, has been seen in the vicinity of the River Dee, close to the bandstand on a number of occasions. Some say this is a nun who drowned in the river many centuries ago, but nobody is certain of her identity. The River Dee has claimed the lives of many over the years. On the 21st of October, 1893, the body of 25-year-old William Henry Shon, who had been missing for two weeks, was pulled from the River Dee. He was due to get married and had withdrawn his savings of five pounds and 17 shillings to pay for the wedding festivities. He was robbed on the banks of the river and it seems he was so distraught that he jumped into the River Dee rather than let down his fiancée. Is the lady in black his fiancée, mourning the loss of the man she had planned to marry? The old Dee Bridge we see today was constructed around 1387 and replaced a series of unsuccessful wooden bridges and Roman structures. On an August morning in 1986, a lady from the district of Handbridge on the south side of the river was walking across the Old Dee Bridge when she bumped into her neighbour. After a few minutes chatting, they both went on their way. Later that day, when she got home, her husband explained he had bad news. Just a few hours earlier, their next door neighbour had passed away, somewhat unexpectedly. Is this an example of a modern-day crisis apparition who appeared on the bridge at the moment of her death? The North Gate carries the city wall's footpath over Northgate Street in the city of Chester. The present North Gate stands on the site of the original northern Roman entrance to the city. The North Gate used to be the location of the city jail until it shut in 1807. It was subsequently demolished. After Northgate Street crosses the Shropshire Union Canal, it becomes Upper Northgate Street, and this is the location for our next haunted building. The Bombay Palace is located next to an old coaching inn, a vital source of transport before the advent of the railways. Built in the mid-18th century, it seems number 11 Upper North Street is home not just to the Bombay Palace, but also a resident ghost. Just before Christmas, in December 2013, the proprietor was alone in the restaurant at approximately 3am when he was startled to hear the noise of a door banging. On investigation, he discovered the noise was coming from the gentleman's toilets. The owner knew the rest of the staff had gone home, with the exception of the waiter, who had retired to the flat above the premises. But, unnerved by the noise and concerned an intruder had accessed the premises, he quickly decided to film the scene on his mobile phone. Without realising it, his phone was on Still's camera and he took several photos which looked innocuous at first. On zooming in, he was absolutely shocked at what he saw on his phone. This is the image he had captured. A distinctly menacing pale face of a man in the background located where the gent's toilet mirror is positioned. Initially the proprietor Mr R. Lee believed the image must have been a light hitting the mirror and reflecting from the gent's toilet. When the toilets are cleaned they utilise a mop to prop the door open. But on closer inspection it appears the photo has captured the image of a face. For some time, customers and staff, including property maintenance employees, have often felt that there is some sort of presence towards the rear of the building. Additionally, in the 1980s, an empty coffin was discovered in the basement of the premises, 
and nobody knew why it was there or the story behind it. When asked if the image could have been altered or enhanced, the owner was quite clear that he doesn't know anything about computers and felt he didn't have the knowledge or skills to carry out such changes. Furthermore, he'd not wanted to show the photograph in case it upset the young children in the family who frequently visit the premises. Is this a genuine haunting and an authentic photograph? What do you think? Chester Royal Infirmary is a former hospital on City Walls Road. The original hospital, which was founded in 1755, is a designated Grade II listed building. The hospital was expanded in the early 20th century. It closed in 1993 and the site has been redeveloped for apartments and housing. The first patient here was William Thompson of St Mary's Parish, who was admitted with a wounded hand in November 1755. There are two ghosts connected to the Chester Royal Infirmary, and both, it seems, are from rather different time periods. The first is a tall, slim man, well-dressed in 18th century clothing, who appears in a white wig, a dark-fitted jacket and breeches. He appears well-nourished, healthy and moves through the building with purpose, disappearing through walls and always in complete silence. Some believe this is the apparition of Dr William Stratford, a local Chester ecclesiast who bequeathed the sum of £300 on his death in 1753 for the establishment of a public hospital. Does Dr William Stratford return to see the infirmary to see if his generous gift has indeed helped the sick and diseased poor people of Chester. Is he proud of the structure built using his funds that has helped thousands of patients in Chester? Many believe the 18th century apparition is Dr John Haygarth, who made a tremendous difference to the health and survival of the people of Chester. Dr John Haygarth spent 30 years working at Chester Royal Infirmary and became one of the best-known physicians of his time. He pioneered advances in infectious diseases, separating those with diseases such as smallpox, typhus and cholera from non-infectious cases. His focus on scrupulous cleanliness and spacious airy wards resulted in an immediate reduction in the death rate. A ward at Chester Infirmary was named after him and in 1778, Haygoth became an important member of the Smallpox Society of Chester. The group advocated inoculation, an unpopular position at the time, and tried to educate the population so as to avoid casual contraction of the disease. Only four years after this effort began, Chester's smallpox mortality rate had been reduced by almost 50%. Perhaps he returns to the infirmary, a place where he spent so many years, making groundbreaking progress in infectious diseases. The second ghost witnessed at the infirmary is nicknamed Soldier Mackenzie. He is thought to be a member of a Scottish Army regiment who was wounded in action during the First World War. He was brought to the infirmary for treatment, but unfortunately he succumbed to his injuries. His restless soul seems distressed. Legends suggest he was buried in a standard hospital shroud instead of his full regimental uniform, of which he was so proud. Members of staff and patients have seen him wandering through the building, searching intensely for his beloved uniform. So preoccupied is he, he doesn't communicate or see the living around him, on the wards or in the corridors. The question is, do the residents of the properties in the converted infirmary today still witness these fascinating brave souls from the past?
In 1848, Chester General Station opened, and within a few years, Chester had become an important transport hub in the northwest of England. The new railway caused a boom in tourism in Chester, and wealthy travellers required luxury hotels. City Road was built along with the Queen Hotel in 1860, which stands proudly on the corner of City Road and Station Road, just opposite Chester General Station. Built to serve first-class passengers who enjoyed its grand Victorian comforts, the hotel has an illustrious past and has hosted celebrities, including Charles Dickens, Cecil Rhodes and Lily Langtry. The Queen Hotel was designed for first-class passengers and employed numerous porters, servants and kitchen staff to cater for their every need. The porters would transfer luggage to the hotel and would even lead guests through a separate covered walkway to ensure passengers did not mix with the undesirables on the streets of Chester. It seems that there are guests at the hotel who never seem to leave. Just one year after it opened, on the evening of Monday, November the 25th, 1861, a devastating fire ripped through the hotel. A man at Chester Station noticed flames coming from a chimney flue and raised the alarm. Fire engines arrived on the scene but were unable to locate the water plug. After an hour of searching, it was discovered in front of the hotel in a ditch, thickly covered over with gravel. By this time, the fire had taken a strong hold and even once the hoses had been connected, the water supply was insufficient. No lives were lost, but the servants' quarters were damaged, with many staff losing their entire stock of clothes and savings. During the restoration and rebuilding of the property, a rather gruesome discovery was made. In the female servants' area, on the third floor, workmen found the mummified remains of a newborn baby underneath the floorboards of one of the rooms. It seems one of the servants may have given birth but fearing the consequences of a child out of wedlock, murdered the infant and hid the body under the floorboards. Three months later, a servant leapt from room 301 and guests on this floor have heard the sounds of a baby crying and a young woman sobbing. Other melancholy incidents include a chef who took his life in the cellar. However, it is not he who appears running through the cellar. It is the apparition of his friend who discovered his lifeless body. Staff hear frantic running, heavy breathing, and see wet, bloody footprints in the cellar corridor. In the spring of 2015, two guests were staying in a suite at the hotel when they arrived at reception at 3am and refused to go back to their second floor room. They had woken to see a man with fair hair, a moustache, and wearing what appeared to be a tailcoat, banging on their window. Moments later, the man appeared inside the room and walked towards the bed where he slowly vanished. At this point, the couple left the room and went to reception. Weeks later, a lady in the same room witnessed what seemed to be the same man standing at the end of the bed, staring at her and pressing his hands on the end of the bed before fading away. She reported this to reception, who felt certain from the description that this was the same apparition. Just who haunts the Queen Hotel in Chester? Would you be brave enough to sleep on the second floor? A property has been located on this site since 1155 and the Pied Bull is thought to be the oldest licensed premises in Chester. 
The old timber frame of an earlier building can be seen inside, but the brick exterior dates back to 1660, and the ground floor arcade and frontage date back to the early 18th century. A cattle market used to exist in this area, and a number of local hostelries make reference to this, including the Pied Bull and the nearby Bull and Stirrup, just outside of the North Gate. On the front of the building is a sign with distances to various English cities, a nod to its long history as a coaching inn. At this time, the Pied Bull extended further down King Street, where outbuildings would provide stables for the horses, shelters for the coaches, and space for equipment, animal feed and repairs. Much of this land has been lost, but the Pied Bull remains a popular hotel, pub, restaurant and microbrewery. But did you know, you might be sharing your pint with one of its many ghosts. Inside the pub is a well-worn wooden staircase from the 17th century. Beneath this is a door that leads down to the cellars, the home of our first ghost. On the 27th of September, 1690, a landlord named John Davis had a fatal fall while descending the stairs into the cellar. It is not clear what happened, but it seems he was carrying a knife, fell and somehow managed to inflict a fatal wound to his abdomen. It is very likely that he carried a knife to open the ale casks at the time, but he expired at the Pied Bull around two o'clock in the morning. Staff are convinced that strange sounds, muttering, footsteps and icy cold blasts on the hottest of days could be linked to the unfortunate distressed soul of John, who died so tragically on his own knife many centuries ago. Is he the man staff have witnessed reading a newspaper in the cellar? Room 9, in particular, on the first floor, seems to be a very active area. In this room, as well as neighbouring rooms 7 and 8, a young lady thought to be a former maid has been seen, as well as in the corridor. She wears a long dark skirt, a somewhat grubby frilly white apron and a pale mob cap. Nobody is sure who she is. Perhaps she is a former employee stuck in a cycle of work. Is she responsible for members of staff and guests feeling a ghostly hand on their shoulder, a prod in the back and sudden cold draughts on the first floor? In addition, in room 9, a man in a blue checked shirt has been seen sitting on the guest chair. One morning in 1985, as two members of staff entered to clean room 9, they witnessed a man sitting on a chair. They assumed he was a guest, apologised for intruding and looked away, but moments later, the man had simply disappeared. Is this the apparition of John Davis, who might be able to roam outside of the confines of the cellar? Another apparition who appears to staff and guests is that of a man wearing dirty work clothes who is believed to be from the 18th century. Nobody knows his identity, but some are convinced his name is Edward. He is thought to be an ostler who died tragically in a fire many years ago. He has been witnessed sitting at a table in the bar, drinking and smoking a pipe. There are two versions of the story connected to the apparition of this man. The first is that after too many drinks, he fell asleep in the stables, his pipe still lit. Unfortunately, the straw caught a light and he was consumed by the flames. The second version states that he vigilantly made the decision on a stormy night to go and check that everything was all right with the horses. At some point he tripped, dropped his lantern that smashed and leaked fuel that ignited the straw. Aided by the fuel and the high winds, the fire spread so quickly he could not escape, and that's how he perished all those years ago.
I hope you enjoyed these stories from the wonderful city of Chester. There are many people who would argue that Chester is possibly the most haunted city in the UK, even giving York a run for its money. And as you can imagine, ghost tourism is big business in Chester, as it is in a lot of the UK cities these days. Um, I probably could have made an entire video just on haunted pubs in Chester. There are so many. If ever you wanted to go on a haunted pub crawl, Chester is probably the place. It was quite difficult to narrow down just a selection of stories for you today, and I debated whether to go further afield into Cheshire, but I think I'll cover that in a, fu in a future video. I've got a few bits and pieces to share with you in a moment, but there are some little ghost stories that I wanted to share with you from Chester. And as you know, this happens all the time when I create my videos. And all of these stories have a sort of medical theme. The first story relates to the King's buildings, which are just off the west side of the North Gate. And these rather grand Georgian houses were constructed around 1775 and originally served as six townhouses for the wealthy residents of Chester. And today they've been divided up into flats and offices and all of that sort of stuff. And there is a story that goes back to the 1960s about a woman who lived in the property being very unwell one night. And whilst she was lying in bed, she was convinced that she was not going to make it through the night. However, as she lay in bed, it seems she was visited by a ghostly doctor of some sort who touched her forehead. And after this ghostly intervention, she made a really speedy recovery. Now, I really like that story, and so I thought, well, I'll look into the past of the building. And I did find something quite interesting. Back in June 1914, the Reverend Canon Sperling died at the age of 70 in his home in the King's Building, having had a stroke the previous month. And his wife had also died in February of that year. And he was a really highly regarded and much loved figure in Chester, who had studied at Oxford. He was actually the canon of Chester Cathedral. He was a missionary and was involved with teaching children to read in local schools. And when he died, the flag on the cathedral was at half mast. So I wonder if the ill lady may have received a visit from Canon Sperling. Maybe his apparition blessed her or something similar. Perhaps he remains in the King's buildings. I'm just speculating, of course, but I did think that was quite a nice story. I haven't been able to find the identity of the Scottish soldier at Chester Royal Infirmary just yet. I will keep looking, but I did find many records of soldiers passing away there from all sorts of different regiments and lots of articles about wounding, wounded soldiers um, being brought back to England with their uniforms still covered in mud. And I suppose it just reinforces just how absolutely awful it must have been for those brave men and their families at that time. Another ghost story linked to a hospital in Chester comes from 1976 at the Old City Hospital, which I think has been demolished now. Apparently, the nurses witnessed a man dressed in a brown suit visiting an elderly lady who was a patient there. And the nurses asked the lady who her visitor was, and she said that she hadn't received any visitors at all. And the nurses were all adamant that they'd seen this rather good-looking young man and described him to her. And the elderly lady replied that the only person that she knew who fitted that description was her son, and he'd been killed in action in the Second World War. And then we have a much more recent ghostly incident dating back to 2014. And it seems a man was visiting his grandfather at the Countess of Chester Hospital. And he took a photograph of his grandfather on his mobile phone. The grandfather was terminally ill with cancer and a mysterious woman in a white veil made an appearance. And here is a picture of the photograph. And apparently medical staff have witnessed this mysterious lady in white who has blonde hair. And apparently one patient began screaming in the night because she saw this figure at the end of her bed. Now, I'm a bit cynical when ghost photographs like this end up splashed all over the national press and make it onto the news. 
Could it be an attempt to gain fame or draw attention to the grandfather's condition, or even one last attempt to reassure his grandfather? Is this a genuine apparition caught on camera? In the newspaper article, the grandfather, whose name is Bob, says, The picture is of my guardian angel. I've got a feeling that whoever it is is watching over me. Gosh, how he caught it on camera, I do not know. I can't understand it. It's amazing. And Bob's wife, Sheila, said in the, in the newspaper article, The picture is the talk of the town. Bob is telling everyone. He's telling all the nurses and doctors who come to visit that someone is looking out for him. I was interested to read that in 2005 at the same hospital, there were reports of poltergeist activity and a mysterious woman dressed in black. Now, this hospital formerly was a, a Victorian lunatic asylum that opened in 1829. And the woman in black has been seen by security guards who work at the hospital. I don't know. Maybe it's haunted. Maybe it's not. Anyway, let's have a little look at some bits and pieces. We'll stick with the medical theme for a little bit longer because I have something very special to show you. This is a document from the Chester Royal Infirmary Pathology Department and it is a post-mortem report from 1942. From what I gather, this lady seems to have had some sort of heart attack um, because atheroma is accumulation of material in the arteries. I couldn't find a record of Emmalina Ann Tunney, but I did find an Irma Linda Ann Tunney in Liverpool, but her dates would make her more like 95, and she also had a daughter who would have been 65. But I did find out quite a bit about the pathologist himself. He was born in December 1892 and he actually trained in Sydney, Australia. I suspect he was probably born there. And then he came to the UK at the end of World War I. And he died in Chester on the 10th of February 1953. He was definitely married and had a son called John. And in his time as a pathologist, he covered all sorts of situations and was often called to give evidence in various murder trials and some were quite high profile, and there's even a ghost story connected to one of these murders. He was involved in the prosecution of Dr. Buck Ruxton. Ruxton had killed his common law wife and their maid in 1935 in a jealous and paranoid fit of rage, and these murders became known as the Bodies Under the Bridge murders, as the dismembered bodies were found, and he became known as the Savage Surgeon and Ruxton was convicted and executed at Manchester Prison by Albert Pierpoint in 1936. Dr Walter Grace was also involved in the investigation into the Cameo murders that took place at the Cameo Cinema in Liverpool in 1949. The cinema manager and his deputy were cashing up at the end of the day when a masked man with a gun came in and demanded that they handed over the cash. They refused and the gunman shot them both dead with six shots. And there was a hunt for the killer and ultimately it led to a huge miscarriage of justice that went on for a very long time. And finally, our pathologist was involved in a murder case in Anglesey that has a ghost story connected to it. So in October 1945, Ivy Nettleton threatened to kill her husband with a bread knife in Anglesey. They were on holiday, I think, from Manchester. She accused him of having affairs, banned him from making new friends, demanded him never to look at another woman and for her decisions never to be questioned. And at this moment, Arthur Albert Nettleton snapped. He killed his wife with a hot iron and initially he hid her body in the bath. And then at 3am, he carried her body down to the water's edge started digging in the sand to hastily bury her body, but was interrupted when a local house switched on their lights. The body was discovered 16 days later by two ladies riding their horses along the beach, and Mr Nettleton was arrested, and after questioning by the authorities, he confessed. 
The court heard that Ivy Nettleton was borderline mentally unstable, psychoneurotic and hysterical. Arthur was convicted of manslaughter and served five years in prison. And the rumours are that Ivy haunts the ruins of a former pub known as The Onions, which is in the area. And she is seen wearing a white shift type dress. Holiday makers have visited the ruins and seen her. She also wanders along the beach. And she also haunts the nearby hotel there, which is called the Min Adon. Now, I don't know if that's where she was murdered. I'm not totally sure. And when the hotel was put up for sale in the 1990s, there were reports of water and gas taps being turned on overnight, so much so that the bar staff made nightly inspections to confirm that everything had been turned off. So I bought this little pathology document for about £2.50, and just a little bit of digging led me to all these murders and a ghost story. I have this lovely menu from the Cunard line and the cover shows the haunted King Charles's tower from the city walls at Chester. Now you know me, I love a menu and this one dates back to 1960 and it comes from a ship called the RMS Saxonia and she was launched in 1954 and her primary route was from Liverpool to Montreal in Canada. She was launched by Clementine Churchill, the wife of Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and eventually she was scrapped in 1999. So let's have a look at our lunch menu for today. So we've got our different soups to begin with. I'm glad to see there's no turtle soup on this menu. We've got chili con carne, which I suspect might have been quite exotic at the time. Roast pork with apple sauce, jacket and mashed potatoes. I will admit that I struggled terribly with the portions of food in America and there seemed to be um, chips or french fries with everything and I had a few meals with mashed potato and they were just so nice. I don't think I want to see a chip for a very long time. I had to look up beef ray four but it seems it's a sauce made with mayonnaise, horseradish, Worcestershire sauce and mustard. Cold buffet looks all very nice. I don't know what head cheese is. I think I'll steer clear of the cheese. I had to look up Oxford brawn and it seems it's sort of chopped meats in jelly. Don't think I'd really like that. And then there's tapioca pudding, which my gran always used to make as a dessert for her and her sisters when we were little. I don't think I ever had it. She always made apple tart for us and it was the best. No recipe involved. She just knew how to do it. And she used to use Bramley's from our back garden. Those were the good days. And finally, I've just got one little postcard for you that dates back to June 1950. Dear John, I am sending this from Liverpool, as we are here today. I came through the Mersey Tunnel Wednesday night. It's a road three miles long and runs under the river, a river big enough to float to the Queen Mary. We are going to Wrexham tonight, so probably get Mum's letter there on Monday. Glad to say I am keeping well. Hope you are. Thanks for your letter. I have only been swimming once, and that was with Paddy. And I I don't know what that says, in beer? In Maybe it's a place, I'm not sure. Anyway, love, Eric. And that was sent to a location in Ely, Cambridgeshire. So I really hope that you enjoyed hearing about the ghosts of Chester. And if you want to follow me on Instagram, you can. I'll put a link in the description below. And I'll see you on the next one, guys. Take care.